The story of Longview Fiber starts with R.A. Long, Robert Alexander Long. That's of Timberland here in Washington State, and he needed a place for his sawmill. He picked what is now Longview for his sawmill. He needed a place for his sawmill workers to live. Kelso was too far away, so he decided to plan a city, to build a city around the sawmill. Mr. Long was a devout Christian, and he had been around lumber camps and, and uh, mining camps, what kinds of places those could be, so he figured if he built his own city, he could provide a wholesome place for mill workers to live and work, and it would provide a stable workforce uh, for his sawmill. So he arranged to, to build the city. Uh, next slide. And this was his dream, was to have build the city of Longview, a wonderful place to live where sunlight is life is at its best. This was a laid out the way they are, a fellow by the name of Nichols. There's a Nichols Boulevard uh, here in Longview. Uh, but the one thing he didn't have is he needed than his sawmill provided, so he was on a camp. Pacific straw and paperboard. Uh, my grandfather ended up owning it uh, years later, but uh, that was actually uh, uh, one of the first businesses that came in in 1925. Um, and <clears throat> The possibility came up that they would build a paper mill there. And Long said, no paper mills. I've smelled paper mills. We're not going to have any paper mills. I don't want them scaring away my uh, lot buyers. That was his whole idea. He wanted people to buy. Uh, uh, I went through the paperwork. It's actually at the Longview uh, Public Library. And he would get these letters from these paper mill operators writing to him, said, I'd like to buy, build a paper mill in your town. Uh, how can I get cheap logs? Because that's what paper makers in, in use, is they used what's called small timber, small logs. This is not what they had in the Pacific Northwest. They had logs that were eight, 10 feet across. So uh, they wanted small logs. And Mr. Long, how much money do you want to contribute to the enterprise? Well, that was a no and a no. Uh, and it, 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 it didn't, probably 10 different companies wrote to Long asking to build a paper mill here in Longview. Next slide, please. This was uh, Longview in about 1925. As you can see, it was, uh, you know, there's some nice uh, buildings there, but most of it, the streets are laid out. A lot of them weren't even paved. Next slide. Okay, the next guy to come along. He ended up selling paper for a company in Wisconsin. Uh, they invited him back. And next slide. In about 1900, uh, to Kokona, Wisconsin, the paper company uh, uh, was cited, and he ended up, next slide, taking over the Tillman Paper Company. It was originally founded in the 1880s. In about 1902, uh, Wertheimer took it over, and in the space of 20 or 30 years, he quadrupled production without increasing any machines. Uh, but they made specialty papers and packaging papers. Uh, no liner board, just paper. Um, in the 1920s, um, they started developing technology to develop craft paper, craft pulp, to make uh, heavier papers, particularly liner board. Corrugated packaging is starting to come into use, and they used a heavier paper, uh, and, and the craft process was coming into being. And they needed to find more, uh, uh, more capacity to compete with the pine that was coming out of the Southwest. This is about the mid-1920s. Uh, next slide. So uh, what happened was, do I have this thing? We have in this slide, we have some smoke coming there in the distance from the um, uh, Long Bell Mill. And what was going on at the time, next slide, uh, this was Longview at the time. What was happening at the time, of course, they would uh, saw these huge logs uh, either in for, for what they call the rail mill, which would go on to, uh, it was dimension number which would go on to uh, rail cars and be shipped east generally, or a cargo mill, which were the logs were cut into big square, uh, they called them uh, uh, Jap squares or Japanese squares, um, and they were just loaded onto ships because then they were milled to dimension overseas. Uh, so it's a cargo mill, that's a rail mill and a cargo mill. Um, but everything else they just burned. They burned some of it for hog fuel for the steam and the power that they had in the plant, but the rest of it they just burned. Next slide. 
Uh, and this is the Long Bell Mill uh, in about 1925. You look up there at the top there, there's nothing where the Longview Fiber property is. But the main thing was that attracted Monroe Wertheimer was this wigwam burner. There's a couple of different stories how uh, Wertheimer got the idea of using waste from this mill as a feedstock or a furnish for paper. But the fact was, is he had the idea, why don't I use this stuff uh, instead of going out in the forest and, and cutting our own logs and having to buy logs and transport them. And all we have to do is get them from here to here. Um, the other thing was is that uh, the uh, Long Bell Mill cut Douglas fir and there were some technological breakthroughs that made it possible to process the Douglas fir, to pulp the Douglas fir into what, into the heavy craft paper, liner board, uh, medium, and um, uh, those things came together and Wertheimer approached uh, the Longview people about building his paper mill here. Okay, what had happened in the meantime is that R.A. Long by this time was in debt $50 million. Now that's $500 million today. He had built Longview, he had laid in sewers and, and streets and built you know, uh, the whole infrastructure and he was in debt over his eyeballs. And he was no longer in a position to say no paper mills. The other thing was is that Wertheimer came in and said, it's not gonna cost you any money. Uh, you know, I'll give you a piece of the company, and all you have to do is sell me steam and sell me the, the, the furnish, the, the, uh, uh, the pieces of wood that, that would have come out of your mill and would normally be burned up. Well, for Long Bell, it was a win-win. Now we're going to sell the stuff we used to burn up, and we get a, a piece of this other company. So they got a deal. Uh, it was it, the... Uh, they had a, a contract, they put the initials on a, on a contract. Uh, Long Bell was gonna get like 25% or 20% of the company um, and everybody was happy. <clears throat> so they were gonna move forward. Next slide, please. So at Christmas, 1925, uh, Monroe Wertheimer goes to San Diego for vacation. He's gonna go to vacation. Uh, and it, in San Diego, uh, next slide, he runs into a shirt tail relative by the name of Harry Wallenberg. I won't try to describe to you how they're related, but it's like in-laws of in-laws and they knew each other. And he ran into this guy, Harry Wallenberg. Harry was in effect between jobs, as we say, only he was some pretty uh, impressive jobs. Um, uh, in this case, he was uh, actually, he was an oil man. He had run a built and run an oil finery in Boston. Next slide. This is Harry in 1915, about the time that Dick Wallenberg was born. He is an engineer in Juneau, Alaska, and he is building dams and power plants and power lines for a mining company there. Next slide. He designed and built this dam. It's called the Salmon Creek Dam. Uh, it is a, what they call a, a reverse arch dam. It's, it's not reinforced concrete because the, the, uh, uh, the shape of the dam, it goes this way and this way so that the water provides the compression necessary to the dam. It's something that had not been used since the Roman Empire. It was actually a re-resurrected technology. Harry designed it piece by piece and he was like 30 years old. Uh, and, but he li found out that he liked building things more than operating things so that when they um, uh, uh, finished this thing, it was like, well, what are you gonna do? So he found another job operating, helping to operate a munitions company. This is in 1917, 16, 17, 18. During the First World War, when the United States uh, uh, business uh, community is making a ton of money selling munitions and everything else to the uh, uh, European powers who were killing each other in the Great War. Um, he took over this munitions company uh, and made it pay. Uh, at the end of World War I, they sold the company out from under him. Remember that, sold the company out from under him. There's a pattern here. Uh, they sold the company out from under him and he became uh, uh, between jobs again. Some of the people he had um, uh, made contacts with said, well, how would you like to build an oil refinery? Well, I don't know anything about building an oil refinery, but sure. And he arranged to get both a salary and an interest in the oil refinery uh, in uh, Everett, Massachusetts, just across the river from Boston. <coughs> And it did very well. And he did that for a number of years when Standard Oil showed up, or not Standard, it was actually Standard of New Jersey, showed up and uh, uh, bought the company. And bought the company out from under him for the second time. Uh, so he uh, uh, was between, uh, between uh, jobs. Next slide, please. Okay, he was between jobs. So 
uh, put ourselves back in San Diego. Monroe Wertheimer has taken the contract. He's got like a 36 page contract. And he sees Harry and he knows what Harry's business experience has been. <coughs> he and Harry had crossed paths before. First of all, they were Shirtail relatives. But Harry sued a paper company on behalf of the oil uh, oil refinery because the paper company had pro promised to buy some oil. There was a recession. They went back on the deal. Harry sued him to fulfill the contract. Didn't really collect too much. But he brought in Monroe Wertheimer, a paper man, uh, as an expert witness. Monroe testified. Harry says, what do you want as a witness fee? Monroe says, now nah. I says, sometime I might want a favor though. And uh, Harry said, well, if you want a favor, you just whistle. I'll get on my horse and I'll I'll come and help you out. Okay, thank you very much, and they went away. So, in San Diego, Harry and Monroe meet each other again. Monroe says, here, I'd like you to show you this contract. This is the sweetest deal you ever saw. Now, when, some, when a relative comes to you and says, this is the sweetest deal you ever saw, what do you do, right? <laughs> You can't run away because <laughs> he's a relative. So he says, I'd like you to look at this. And he says, well, he says, I'm whistling, I'm whistling. Okay, so he looks at the contract. The next morning he comes back and Harry says, here you go, thank you very much. What do you think? Well, I don't want to talk about it. Well, wait a minute, what's wrong? No, I don't want to talk about it. Uh, all right, he says, I'm whistling, come on, tell me what's, he says, well, this, there's problems with this deal. Now Monroe Wertheimer had already gotten a lot of money from friends and colleagues and so on to underwrite this idea of a paper mill using waste wood. And uh, he's now, he's kind of concerned. What, what's this all about? So Harry then ticks off all the things that are wrong with the deal. Um, uh, there's not enough space, there's not enough property involved. Uh, the, they want too much money. We've got to, you depend on one source of supply for, for your wood. There's a theme here. One source of supply for your wood. Um, uh, you're, you're, they own too much. Uh, the, the other company's got too much of the deal. Uh, and I don't like your personnel situation because Monroe was going to bring his 25-year-old son into the deal to run the mill. Um, see, does that sound familiar? Okay. So, um, he, uh, uh, so Harry says, you know, there's these things wrong with it. And Monroe says, okay, I really need your help. I got to go meet with Robert Alexander Long in his building, which is the second tallest building in Missouri, and we got to work out a deal. So they go, next slide please, and they meet with R.A. Long. They said, tell you what, you guys go back to your hotel. If you don't get a call by 1.30, you can get back on the train and go home because we don't have a deal. And they went back to the hotel and they waited and sure enough they got a call, come back in. And Harry took over the negotiations and they worked out a deal to construct this mill with more property and the shifting around the interest, that sort of thing. And um, uh, Harry said, there you go, okay, have a good time. And Monroe says, listen, I gotta have you take this over. You've got to take this over for me. Harry said, okay, he figures, I'll tell you what, I'll put some conditions on this he can't possibly accept. He says, I want an interest in the mill. I got to run it. It's not going to be a joint venture between this and somebody else. It's going to be an independent company. Uh, and uh, 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 I got to do it from San Francisco. I'm not going to move to Longview. <laughs> I mean, you saw what Longview looked like. You know, Harry had, a, Harry had enough money to live on. He did not need to work. Did not need to work. So, uh, uh, Wertheimer said, okay. So, in the summer of 1926, they form a company and they call it Longview Fiber, F-I-B-R-E, which was kind of a fancy name of writing fiber. If you remember, there, there were the word center can be spelled R-E, theater, R-E, that's right. So fiber became that. And it was incorporated uh, with uh, Harry Wallenberg as the uh, president. Next slide. So they start building a mill in the fall of 1926. An early picture here, you can see the uh, outline, the structure there for the pulp mill. You see. Uh, there's actually even some trees still on the on the property. Uh, next slide. And they bring the they borrow an engineer from Tilmany uh, paper, uh, along with a lot of machinists, superintendents, back tenders. They bring them out. They recruit them to come out to Longview to pick up their families and move. Uh, some of them pile into a car and negotiate what roads there were all the way out to to. Longview. Others take the train, but they make their way out here. This is uh, uh, Charles Seaborn. He was the Tilmany engineer. He was the first engineer at Fiber. He built the plant um, and he stayed on. 
Uh, he passed away in 1938, so you don't see too much about his name on it. But I talked to some engineers who said that they still found his notebooks uh, in the, in the uh, engineering library there at Fiverr. Next slide. <coughs> Another picture of the uh, construction underway. Is the office building, the, the main office building, which is still the same, was smaller than the, the office building that, that uh, exists today. Um, next slide. Uh, and of course, the smokestack, that was a big deal. Next slide. 60s, uh, when they went to all, uh, you know, they didn't need to burn as much hog fuel. They were using uh, uh, oil and gas and so on. Um, uh, this is a very bad picture of uh, Bob Wertheimer. Uh, Wertheimer, and uh, uh, he was uh, 26, 27 years old when he came to Longview with his uh, wife, and I think it was two little boys then, and they moved to Longview. He was to be the mill manager, uh, and he took over. Uh, there are a number of stories about his background. At one point, his dad had given him a job in a mill back east, and he made a total botch of it by being too authoritarian and too... Uh, dictatorial, uh, and uh, his dad pulled him out of it and he made him an assistant engineer in Tilmany. Um, but when he came out to Longview, it was like a different guy. There's a, a, a they, there was a, there's a story, and it's in the book, maybe one of you told me, uh, that somebody showed up one day and they're building the mill and they said, I'm, you know, I'm looking for a job, and who do I talk to? And this guy says, well, as soon as the guy gets out of the pit, uh, you know, uh, you can talk to him. And it was Bob Wertheimer, you know, who, who had a reputation for just getting his hands dirty to, to fix things and to do things. Very, very highly uh, He ended up staying 30 years and he died on the job. He died at the mill in 1957. Next slide. Okay, here is the mill up and running in 1927. Kind of a bad picture. You'll get a bigger picture in the uh, book, but you'll see uh, it's, uh, you know, there's the smokestack and the office here. Um, and uh, it's hard to see on this, but, uh, you know, we have chip piles and, and stuff at this end of the mill. But a guy by the name of Clark Everest, he was, they gave him the title of vice president. But I think he probably visited the mill four times. Uh, he was the president of a paper mill in, the, in Wisconsin, but he was a big investor. And the reason I have his picture is I owe this guy a lot because he saved every piece of paper he got from uh, Monroe Wertheimer and Harry Wallenberg and Bob Wertheimer. He saved them, saved it all for like 35 years and is now at the Wisconsin Historical Society and we got copies of it. And I went through that stuff and I was able to read these memos of Harry Wallenberg talking about negotiating with the union things like that, and it was really, really precious to someone as a historian because I didn't have access to the company archives. <laughs> it's probably good I didn't have access to the company archives because I'd still be reading them, uh, but I was able to put together a story. Next slide. Okay, this is an, uh, I, I put this in here. This is an example bring chemicals in, one bucket at a time. He's unloading a ship. In this case, he's unloading sulfur. Uh, you'll notice the protective gear he's wearing, a hat. Of gloves. Next slide. And this is a sam This is an example of cars, or the waste wood cars. This is an old box car that they modified. Load up the waste wood. They would have guys with what they call pickaroons uh, pulling off uh, the best blocks of wood. And of course, they didn't want wood with bark on it. That that wood would go over to the to the hog burner. They wanted good, clean fur, and uh, they'd pull it off and fill these things up. One of the things that Bob Wertheimer did is they had to figure out a way to charge for the wood. So he, fi he got a bunch of wood and he piled it, you know, piled it up and he steamed it and they weighed it and it came up with like 2,200 pounds and that became what they call a bone dry unit. Some of you may have dealt with a BDU and that became the charge. The charge to uh, that um, uh, Long Bell uh, build fiber was $1 a BDU, okay, plus $1 transportation. So for $2 a, a unit, they were able to get the furnish, and that was the secret to the mill getting started. Um, does anybody know the cost of a BDU like in 1990? North of 100 bucks. 
I mean, it was up and down, all, it was all over the place. So the, the whole cost of chips, some of you may have been laid off because there weren't enough chips. Uh, but that was a big, big deal, is, is, is the source of chips. The source of chips was everything in the success of Longview Fiber. Next slide. <coughs> Another shot of the mill. All of this is all wood, all ready to... Uh, this is how they, uh, uh, they would go from these blocks of wood down to the, to the small chips that then would go to, next slide, a digester. I took this picture myself. I took a tour of the mill and I had to take a picture of a digester. These are no longer in operation, of course, but they, <clears throat> in the old days. Anybody here work on the pulp mill? Anybody here work on these digesters? Okay. I actually saw them do it. What? You saw What they did was, is yeah. that up there is the top, the whole ceiling is full of chips. And uh, uh, then they would swing in a kind of a, a funnel, and then they would fill the digester up, swing the funnel out of the way, bolt this thing down here with, I, forget, I think there was 12 or 15 uh, bolts. Next slide. And they would cinch it down with this, this branch, which is this tall. And uh, um, next slide. And they would control the control it through this this panel again like I say this is all out of operation the only reason I got to go here is because it's out of operation I wasn't allowed to go into the pulp mill it was too dangerous I go into the machine room could go into the box plant but I couldn't go in the pulp mill um, so uh, but that's what it looked like and this this is this is where it started next slide this is machine number one it was a cylinder machine uh, it was installed it was up and running in like October seven. So it was like 14 or 15 months from the time they started dr drilling piles, driving piles, until this guy spun up. <laughs> Took them a while to get it right because they were making a new kind of paper with a new kind of pulp. Uh, but uh, uh, this was a, a liner board. And what they did was, is, okay, now you've got all this, this liner board, what do we do with it? Uh, and they would try to sell it, and Harry was the salesman, he would try to sell it. But companies like Crown Zellerbach were telling their customers, if you buy their liner board, we're not selling you any other kind of paper. So Harry had to find a few independent box uh, converting plants, box manufacturers, who would take um, the liner board. Uh, and he found a, a couple, one in Pennsylvania, one in Massachusetts. And Harry found a, 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 a shipping line that used non-union labor and wore surplus ships and they could ship it through the canal cheaper than they could send it to Portland uh, on a truck. Uh, and that was another secret. Harry knew the shipping business from the old And so he knew how to, to find the, the, the best deal. Next slide. This is machine two. So even before machine one is ready, they're starting to buy machine two. This is a Yankee, it's a machine glaze machine and they started re uh, recruiting guys from uh, to come out and operate this and this turned up its first role in the spring of 1928 okay with these old timers by that time there's probably 300 people, mostly men of course next slide uh, here's an example of a, of a cylinder reference I won't try to describe you but basically the big big deal is you have these big cylinders uh, on which the paper is 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 prepared and then it goes through the, the rolls next slide and then a forger near has is like this with with its all the all the rollers, um, and uh, uh, so those are the two terms you will hear: cylinder and forger near. Next slide. Uh, okay, here is the mill. Um, here, this is the uh, Long Bell Mill, of course. Another uh, later picture of the mill. Next slide. Uh, okay, this is machine four. Okay, the. Green Uh, explanations as to why it happened and and it hit Cowlitz County and it hit Longview uh, just like everywhere else but Longview Fiber kept building in in the time of the Great Depression he added a bag plant he added a box plant he bought two machines he added additional digesters uh, and, and he kept building and he kept adding payroll and the payroll generally almost doubled in the course of the 1930s wages didn't but the payroll did increase. So in the, in the time where a lot of people are out of work, fiber is hiring people. Now, that's the good news. So you're usually supposed to do the bad news first and then the good news. So the bad news was, is that in 1932, fiber announced a wage cut, wage and salary. Wages and salaries cut 10%. And then about six or eight months later, they did it another 10%. Because paper prices had fallen through the floor. There was a general 
deflationary trend. If you listen to economists, they're terrified of the idea of deflation. What you buy today is going to be worth less tomorrow. And then, that's, then the economy begins to seize up. <clears throat> so they cut wages. 1933, 19, 1934. This is an important date for you. 1934 is when the uh, New Deal enacted the national and in the national uh, National Industrialization Act, which made it possible for bargaining units to collectively bargain with industry. And they had to come together and they had to do it. And it was a resurrection of the international unions. There were two unions at the time, pulp and paper maker, pulp and sulfite workers, and the paper makers, <coughs> who didn't have anything to say to each other. In fact, they were at war for many, many years. Um, but they finally made their peace, but they wouldn't combine. Um, and they finally started talking to the industry. Out here in the Northwest, there was buckus when it came to organizing uh, uh, pulp mill workers, paper mill. First of all, there weren't very many paper mills. There were like three. There was one here. There was one in Camas. There was one in uh, St. Helens. There was one in, I don't know, <laughs> maybe Oquium. Oquium. There was one in Oquium. <clears throat> very, very small mills. So. Um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the international unions, and I won't go into all the details, began to organize, uh, and, and there were two locals here in, in uh, uh, Longview. There was 153 and 261, I think it was, um, uh, one representing each one. But what they would do is, is the international unions would negotiate directly with the Manufacturers Association. There was one set of negotiations every year, unless they skipped a year, and they would negotiate a contract that applied across the entire industry. <clears throat> that was great for um, uh, management because they knew what the score was on um, uh, wages, and everybody paid the same wages. Secondly, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it was just it was a one-stop shop there. The bad news on that was is that the locals had almost no say in the process. Um, next slide. Uh, this is another machine. Next, uh, this is a space when you saw machine four. This is they left room in the room in the machine room for another machine. They didn't know what it was going to be, but they left room for it. This is like 1934. Next slide. <coughs> Depression. Big deal was, uh, you know, buy American newsprint. Don't buy it from overseas. Uh, a lot of uh, isolationism. Uh, it applied. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is difficult to read, uh, it'll be better, uh, but it came out of a magazine showing in 1941 five machines in operation and how each machine works, starting with the different feedstocks, going through to, uh, uh, you know, different outputs, trucks, that sort of thing. Next slide. Um, and this is the first. Here's a chip car, here's a hemlock log. Harry started using hemlock. He could find out that he could, he could use the hemlock for particularly medium. It wasn't as strong, but it didn't need to be. So he bought, a, and nobody wanted to buy these hemlock logs for lumber, uh, but he relied, he would buy them by the raft full. A couple of tugboats, bought a couple of tugboats. Using hemlock. Next slide. Uh, five change you can see at the top, number one was a cylinder machine. Number two was a, the, this a, see a cylinder machine. Three was a forge and ear. Four was a cylinder machine. Number five was a forge and ear. So we had, they had a, a mixture of it. Generally, this uh, a corrugator, the liner board would go to a corrugator. Here's a paster that would go to a, 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 a box maker. Uh, here's a towel. Uh, end of it. Here's uh, uh, different kinds of towels down here and uh, uh, the bag machines with printers and so on. So um, the company was involved in a variety of different uh, products. This slide, because it's kind of cute, the, uh, they had a convention every year of the Technical Association of the Pulp and Paper Industry and they dressed this woman up in uh, all paper, uh, you know, for one of their conventions. So I thought that was kind of cute. Next slide. <clears throat> and I told you about the negotiations. <clears throat> the thing about the negotiations is that they came together every year, but there was one individual who was kind of the, not so much the driving force, but the intellectual force. And it was Harry Wallenberg. And they...
here, this is uh, uh, Bob Wertheimer. He's negotiating. Um, and some of the, uh, the old time uh, liberals would come into a room, uh, they would say, oh, it's Einstein. Because he do contract. Next slide. Harry, this is 1930, this is 1940. Next slide. Uh, I had to show you this. This is my father's union card. My father was a carpenter, uh, and he uh, um, made 70, I've got, I've got some water right over there. If that's, that's, how nice. She can tell I, my Again, Ron, Thank you. One of the things Ronald Reagan did before he had like a national address, you know, a TV address, something like that, he would get a glass of hot water and he would drink hot water and it would make his voice more husky. So that when you listened to him, you were thinking that he was being very emotional. Well, he actually did that with hot water. So anyway, I don't, that's not hot water, that's just water. Anyway, it's my dad's union card, next slide. And he paid his dues of $2 a week up until he was actually, he fell in arrears. He got behind. He paid it up through July 13th, 1942, and then he joined the Army. And he went from $21 a month. But I had to show that to you because I had a copy of that. So. Next slide. Uh, it's a box, and here's a, the, uh, the uh, box plant, the bag plant, more warehouses. Uh, still, at this point, they're operating five machines. Uh, bigger pulp mill. And it's a pain in the neck because, um, first of all, a lot of men go off, if they don't go off to the service, and like 250 people out of a workforce of six go off to the service, but a bunch more literally, literally got reassigned. Good morning, you're going to work at a shipyard. You're an electrician, you're now working for Kaiser. It wasn't your choice. <laughs> and they lost a lot of tradespeople that had to go to, go to the shipyards because they had the priority. So that left fiber scrambling for uh, help. Next slide. And this is a roll, the fiber honor roll. I was able to identify three fiber employees who did not come home. Um, a bomber pilot, um, let me think, a railroad worker killed in an accident, and, a, and an infantryman killed in 1944. Um, uh, as near as I can tell, everybody else came home. Uh, so that ultimately about 250 names uh, on the honor roll. Next slide. Uh, but this was the solution to the labor problem. Hire women. And the company had to go through this elaborate process uh, negotiating the uh, uh, jobs of women and how women would be paid and what kind of the jobs would be programmed. It was very complex. But uh, this was one of the things that they could do. Uh, and uh, this was a good shot of a woman hauling wood, you know, because you could go outside and get lots of light. Next slide. Uh, or obviously the women in the box plant, they were already working in the box plant, working in the bag factory. Next slide. Another, another shot here. This is a, uh, is this a towel machine? Yeah, this is a towel machine. Next time, next line. <clears throat> this is the uh, part of machine five. It was the brand new machine. Really had a lot of trouble getting this thing going. <laughs> uh, thank you, D. Wilma, for writing a book about his, where, about his life, but including a lot of time at Fiber. And he would talk about all the trouble that they had with machine five. Uh, next slide. Uh, part of machine five. Next slide. Uh, this was a, uh, I take this because uh, Fiber used this as uh, to advertise the bag, the bags that it produced, this, uh, these uh, uh, cement bags and so on. And of course, any point in time, anybody in World War II took a picture of an industrial thing, they would try to get a woman into it. So they brought this woman out from the office probably in her dress, gave her a hard hat, and then she posed with the, the oil field here. But that just, so every time you see pictures of that, just remember that there was probably some theater involved. Um, women did everything. This woman does not work for, did not work for Longview Fiber. She worked for St. Helens, down in St. Helens, Oregon. But they gave her a gun and some bullets, and she... Next slide. Uh, again, a towel. Here's a counter roll. Woman, uh, spin, you know, uh, turning up a counter roll. Next slide. Uh, box plant. Next slide. Uh, here we are back at the, at the grinder. Next slide. Uh, okay, one of the big things that fiber made was called V-board. 
victory board, and it was uh, wasn't it was it was not corrugated. It was uh, you know uh, actually there was a corrugated, but this was the idea was supposed to be tough enough <coughs> that they could throw it in the water and float it ashore. As a practical matter, that's not how you invade Normandy. You put it on a truck and have the truck come ashore. But this was the this was the wartime public relations on on V board. Next slide, and they had to take boxes together and they would push them off of counters and they would push them off the shelf to see if how they would hold up. Uh, but that was a big, big part of the uh, of the, the product lines that they did. Uh, again, it wasn't corrugated. This was all very, very thick uh, uh, cardboard, you know. Next slide. Um, fiber employees were involved in local uh, civil defense, uh, all kinds of uh, emergency planning. Uh, my uncle D. Wilma was a uh, neighborhood block warden which was a real pain in the neck. These guys belong to the, the state home guard. And um, uh, most of these guys are fiber employees. A couple of them were long bell. But they didn't even have enough guns. And if you look closely, they actually had to bring their shotguns home from to work. You know, So that, they're going to stop the Japanese. Next slide. They were, had to be very innovative. This was a forklift type arrangement that was put together out of a Mack truck and some other equipment. You couldn't buy new trucks, new equipment, because everything was going to the war. Um, and this was called the Wert Wertheimer tank. And they put this together out of spare parts. Lots and lots of stories about uh, you know, going out to the scrapyard and making do with what they had. The other thing that they did, next slide. Um, uh, this is a joke. This is a cartoon that appeared, a company cartoon appeared uh, carpooling. Everybody had to carpool because only certain people had gas rationing. That was a big deal. So everybody would carpool. Next slide. Here's a bunch of uh, uh, cartoons uh, talking about the uh, uh, how hard it was to get uh, chlorine and how short, how uh, hard it was to... Uh, um, next slide. Uh, here's one, uh, and this is uh, E. Gads. Uh, what's that bike doing here? I really need it, Mr. Siebers. That was Tony Siebers. Did everybody, anybody know Tony Siebers? Anyway, he was a superintendent. I'm the new third hand on number five, the new foundry fourth hand on number three, and the new back tender on the number one machine. During World War II, Harry Wallenberg's son, Dick, who had started working at the, at the mill, um, before the war, the school came to work at Fiber, uh, fell in love, went into the service, and uh, uh, came out a lieutenant colonel, uh, and came back. Uh, one of the problems that Harry had is that the government then took all of his hemlock logs and built barracks out of them. This was hemlock, which was no good as lumber, and they built barracks. How many here have spent a night in one of these buildings? Okay, three or four of us. <laughs> Identical construction, whether you're in Alaska. And, and all of Harry's wood was going this way, and Harry found out that all of the companies that had their own trees, that owned their own tree farms, did not have to worry about a source of lumber. If they didn't grind, you know, if they didn't use the lumber directly, they at least had something to trade. So in 1943, Bob Wertheimer went out looking for trees to buy, to buy tree farms. Next slide. And they started buying up land on it with tree farms so that they could have their own trees. And that was the beginning of the Timberlands program. And it started with 80 acres. Uh, by the time the company sold in uh, 2007, it was over a half million acres of the trees. And the Timberlands program be ended up becoming a very, very significant part of the revenue stream at the company and a very, very significant part of its assets uh, at the time of its sale. Next slide. Uh, here's a couple of uh, uh, logging at the time. They actually were using uh, chainsaws back in the 1930s. As soon as they could figure it out uh, that they were more efficient, they bought them up as fast as they could make them. Next slide. Uh, okay, after World War II, before World War II, in 1928, Harry bought a box plant in Springfield, Massachusetts, General Fiber Box. The idea being is that if you are going to sell boxes, you need
manufacturing on the West Coast had begun to grow, particularly in the agricultural sector. This is the box plant in Los Angeles. They bought property in Los Angeles and in Oakland, California, and they weren't able to build it out until 1948. So this is uh, uh, Los Angeles, and this is a corrugator. The liner, the, uh, uh, the liner board would come in, and they would put it together with the. This is a later picture of Bob Wertheimer. Um, he was, uh, like I say, he passed away in 1957. He showed up at work on a Sunday to check things. He went up to a very, very high floor uh, to check on a new uh, pulp washer, uh, climbed 80 feet worth of stairs, was all over the mill, and then they found him in his car. Uh, uh, he had, uh, had a heart attack. So uh, um, uh, that's when Dick Wallenberg took over as basically the head of operations in, in different jobs, vice president uh, in, in uh, Longview. Next slide. Uh, Harry, later picture of Harry Wallenberg. Harry uh, lived until 1979. He worked until just two days before he died, but he was president until 1969 when Dick was able to become president. He became the chairman of the board. And then seven or eight years later, Harry actually took a retirement. But he's 92 years old, and he was still going to work. Uh, very, very highly regarded. Uh, more stories about his wisdom and his uh, uh, just plain smarts at business. Uh, uh, but it's all going to be in the book. But this is the formal picture of Harry. Next slide. Uh, this is a box plant in Utah, I think. Uh, not a very good one. Next slide. Uh, later picture of the plant in 1960. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is this is before they've installed the round treatment. Made everybody build things like these treatment systems. But this is about 1960. Next slide. Uh, Columbus Day Storm, 1962. This is really important because the Timberlands business was a way to keep the chip supply up. They didn't cut down trees and then bring them to the mill. They cut down trees, sold them to sawmills, and then made a deal with the sawmills to buy back the chips. In some cases, they actually helped build uh, chipping machines at the sawmills so that all that fiber had to do was to import the chips from the sawmills. Uh, but they made more money selling logs to sawmills than they would if they'd somehow chipped up the entire logs. So fiber, like it or not, was already in the, in the log business. Okay, this storm came along October 12, 1962, and blew down tens of millions of trees. And if you know, I'm sure you do, you've got about three years to get those trees off the ground if you expect to sell them. So there became a big, big effort to um, uh, get those trees off the ground and onto the market. Next slide. And they found out it was Japan. Uh, the Japanese economy was finally, uh, after 20 years after the Second World War, uh, uh, coming up, and the Japanese were buying logs like crazy. And all of these logs were going to Japan, and they discovered that they could make a lot of selling logs, sometimes more than selling paper. And um, in the annual reports that they had, uh, Longview Fiber was a pulp uh, packaging, a paper and packaging uh, industry that also had tree farms. In 1975, Longview Fiber was a tree farm company that also sold uh, paper and packaging. So the whole uh, priority of businesses shifted in about 1975. Next slide. Uh, here's a picture of women in the uh, bag plant. Uh, this is in connection with, uh, next slide, uh, union organizing. After 25 or almost 30 years of the international unions negotiating on behalf of all the locals, the locals began to push back. Uh, you know, we can do a better log, what, better job. What does our say? And by the and the big deal was, what are you doing with all our money? Uh, money was going to fat salaries to people that they didn't elect in the East Coast. So as you know, 
uh, <coughs> various locals held elections to recertify uh, new unions uh, to uh, bargain with the employers. And so they went with basically one bargaining situation uh, to multiple bargaining situations. And that's the birth, birth of your, well, the rebirth, uh, rejuvenation of your local here, 1964, 63, 64. Um, and, and then the combining of the two locals into the one local that ended up dealing with, with fiber. Uh, this is a picture of a, uh, uh, I, this is part of the campaign uh, to, um, uh, uh, to recertify. Uh, when, when they had to have an election between the, and it was a very acrimonious kind of a thing that, uh, you know, union bosses would come out and threaten the members and threaten the locals and stuff like that. Next slide. And then, of course, there were three strikes, um, uh, two short ones and one real long one in 1978. Uh, it's uh, uh, despite all of the noise and apparent acrimony, uh, everything settled back to normal. Uh, uh, pretty well. This uh, I, I snagged this picture out of a, a historical quarterly, uh, and there are other pictures. There's one of Dick Wallenberg walking through the picket line in 1978, uh, and he actually he has it blown up, and it was it was a, a prominent part of his um, uh, memorial service, uh, getting going across the picket line. So I don't know if you know this, but in December 1978, for those of you who are there. You guys had been you guys have been out for five months, and Dick Wallenberg called in Bob Arkell. Bob Arkell was the the bad dog negotiator that Dick hired to, to deal with the human or HR issues and negotiations. And Dick said, "Okay, I've made a decision. We're gonna we're gonna hire replacement workers." And and this is after four or five months. He says, "We're gonna you know we're just gonna start hiring." And Bob says, "Don't do that." Please don't do that. That'll tear this town apart. You can't do it. Let me go back and talk to them. One thing or another, I finally got a settlement. But whether or not you guys know it, the <laughs> fiber was that close to, to uh, just hiring more people. Uh, I mean, can you imagine what that would have done to, to the community? Um, uh, so part of, part of our history here. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is an example. Of, uh, some of the more high-tech uh, stuff you'll have to tell I think this is machine 11 I think uh, but it's much uh, uh, you know computers and color <laughs> stuff like that I'm sorry that the slides don't turn out a little bit better um, uh, but let's face it I'm the star of this not the slideshow uh, next slide uh, another shot of, uh, uh, of a machine uh, uh, next slide um, Okay, what kind of things I can tell you about the 60s, 70s, 80s? Uh, a lot of expansion, a lot of hiring. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, Reynolds cut back, Weyerhaeuser cut back. Uh, Dick hired a lot of uh, people off of those. And you had, uh, for example, it wasn't unusual to have uh, someone in his 40s or his 50s working as a plumber's helper uh, uh, and, uh, you know, kind of keep people going. Uh, the, uh, the downside of it was that some of these guys in their 40s and 50s couldn't do what guys in their 20s could do. And so that was, that was a downside of it. Another shot of uh, uh, turning up a reel. Next slide. Uh, okay, a corrugator. This is an example of a corrugator. Bob Wertheimer uh, was the mill manager here for a while. This is the, the, the son of Bob Wertheimer. One of the problems I had with this project is I've got three Wallenbergs. Two of them are named Richard, and I've got three Wertheimers. Two of them are named Robert. So that, when you're writing a story, you've got to give each of them a, a, a precise uh, uh, identity. So Robert Wertheimer was running things, ran the container group, con, uh, container group and uh, uh, manufacturing and sales in San Francisco, and he liked new equipment. He liked a lot of new equipment, and so they invested in a lot of new stuff in the conversion plants. Not always the best decision, particularly considering the ability to sell the boxes uh, and the material. But uh, they had state-of-the-art stuff. Everybody says that these conversion plants were really top drawer. In fact, they were buying so many machines, they worked out a deal. They had to buy like 35 of these machines. And uh, uh, so they worked out a deal, so they got every 10th one free. I mean, that, <laughs> that was pretty cute. Next slide. OK, another uh, corrugator, you know, just a, a machine, a factory. 
Uh, and this is what the this was the whole idea: is to manufacture these boxes and hopefully print on them, uh, and to provide uh, uh, good solid packaging material for the customer. Um, uh, uh, and in some of the machines actually even did printing and there was just a whole staff of, of designers and engineers to, to figure out the best way to make these boxes. Next, next slide. Uh, later picture of Dick. Uh, Dick ran things pretty much from 1957 until he retired. Um, <clears throat> And uh, a lot, a lot of stories about Dick. I uh, like to have lunch in the cafeteria. Um, if everybody who says they had lunch with Dick twice a week uh, really did, they would need a really big table. I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people had lunch with Dick, but apparently everybody, anybody could. Uh, I guess you had to get there first if, if Bob Arkell or Ray McDermott or somebody wasn't already sitting with him. Um, but. Uh, uh, came across as pretty gruff, but when you talk to him, he was reasonable. Uh, very conservative man, um, and uh, uh, but he was also a trustee at Reed College, a very liberal institution in Portland. Uh, uh, he and his wife supported uh, local charities. The company itself did not get in too much involved in, in supporting local uh, uh, charities. Little League teams here and there. Uh, if, if you wanted to support your Little League team, you had to come in and make your case. But for the most part, the, uh, the giving was on the part of individual employees and, and, uh, 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 and allowing employees to get involved in civic activities. Uh, school board, city council, uh, various advisory committees. Uh, the uh, uh, turbine room at uh, Fiber was a good source for talent for the public utility district because these guys already knew electricity and power and stuff. So next slide. Uh, okay, and Timberlands program is growing and getting more sophisticated. Like I said, it started as 80 acres in 1943, uh, and uh, and it grew to hundreds of thousands of acres. And grow them again and harvest them on a 60-year cycle. And the idea was that the plan was is that to, to have a, a, a perpetual source of wood if not directly for chips, at least to sell to sawmills, who would then sell the chips back to, uh, to fiber. Um, as it turned out, chips got more and more expensive because everybody started using chips. Um, uh, old corrugated containers ended up being almost a third of the source of fiber for the mill by the 1990s. Uh, so there never were enough chips. Next slide. Uh, part of the uh, forest uh, reforestation programs, they would they would track track it tree by tree. Uh, uh, not that every tree had a number, but uh, this is how they did it. Next slide. Incidentally, has anybody heard? Remember the the movie Officer and a Gentleman? Yeah. With okay, it was almost filmed at the fiber mill, but Dick said no. Uh, Paul Newman uh, called Never Give an Inch. It's a logging movie. That was a fiber tree farm, and fiber people were the um, uh, Consultants on the on the men, and one day they almost shut the whole thing down when they caught the crew smoking, machines still running. Uh, so they had machines were a problem, and because of the size of the the uh, uh, the trim, uh, it was a lot of difficulties. Uh, Dick Wallenberg did not want to shut down any machines because it would mean laying off staff. He did not want to do that. Uh, so the debt went up, and the paper business was never really bounced back to what the predictions were. I can read you a, uh, in fact, where is, uh, there's a computer bag on that chair right there. If you could pass it forward to me, there's something I want to read to you in a minute. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the one on the bottom. Yeah, the one on the bottom. Thank you. Um, so um, thank you. Um, the, uh, um, Wall Street analysts were saying, "Boy, fiber is a good buy, and and uh, uh, you know it's a, it's you know as soon as the paper business bounces back, uh, you know fiber is the place to invest." And um, uh, but it never happened. And as a consequence, by the end of the uh, by the end of the uh, the decade, fiber was deeply in debt, and the uh, uh, it wasn't doing what it should in, in terms of being a business. There it is. So kind of the wake up call came when machine number one died. Many of you probably remember that. A dryer broke 
fell into the basement, massive collapse. And Dick proceeded to um, rebuild it at the cost of over a million dollars. And it didn't do any good. It was, you know, money, money down the road. So the board and uh, Rick, and Rick at that time was uh, in the container uh, conversion side of things, uh, talked to Dick and convinced him that it was time for him to step aside and that Rick would be elected president. And Rick was elected president on September 11th, 2001. He was getting ready to go to the meeting and guess what's on TV? So uh, one of the first things that they had to do was to get their debt squared away is to get it refined. Oh, then right after that, several things happened. The Bonnevere Power Administration uh, basically cut off the contract by which Fiber was making several million dollars a month selling power to BPA and it went the other way. They had to start buying it for that much money. So that was a big kick in the head. Then in, uh, then the bank said, no, you're going to have to uh, restructure your debt uh, for a lot more money. So there started a whole uh, struggle to get the debt down and to get the business, uh, as Rick says, to make it a viable business. And that started, and there was a number of things that uh, were undertaken. Uh, uh, there was some uh, machines shut down. Uh, there was uh, layoffs, particularly in the mechanical department. St. Valentine's Day massacre. Um, any victims of that? All right. Anyway, mechanics were laid off uh, on June, uh, February 14th. I think it was 2003. Um, <clears throat> a couple of other national events that influenced these of the, the end of the story. The first one, and you've heard, probably heard about this, but in 1999, uh, the Congress, and signed off by the President, uh, repealed uh, the Glass-Steagall Act, which prevented uh, investment banks from getting involved in the stock market. So now these investment banks, like Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs got started getting involved in the, in the stock market. Second thing that happened was Enron. And Enron resulted in some legislation called Sorbanes-Oxley, which then uh, imposed upon corporate boards new responsibilities and new restrictions. Up until now, boards can do what they want. Now, these are the individuals that are hired by the company to run the company on behalf of the shareholders. At Fiber, the board had been controlled for 70 or 80 years by uh, family members. Usually, there were four founding family members on the board of nine or ten or eleven or uh, nine or ten or eleven, plus uh, corporate officers. Most of the rest of the board, and sometimes there were a couple of outside, what they call outside directors that weren't connected with the company. Under this new law, Sorbanes-Oxley, they had to start hiring more and more people who were not connected with the company, who were not, did not have an interest in the company that would then come in and, and run it on behalf of the shareholders. So those things are set up. So at this point, um, uh, the, uh, uh, Rick and the directors decide they, the, the, the best thing is to make fiber what they call a real estate investment trust, capitalizing on the timberlands, make the timberlands the core business with the mill as a subsidiary, and it would change the tax structure, the tax uh, 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 liability for the shareholders and the way that they pay taxes, and we'll get into it right now. So they had this big corporate uh, revolution underway uh, to do that. Now the Raiders start coming in. And what happened was, is uh, uh, first one company, or combination of companies, uh, approached, the, approached Fiber to buy, and they, uh, they wouldn't, they never did. They never, made an, they never made an offer. But in the summer of 2006, <coughs> A lot of there's, there, there is pressure from shareholders who are now no longer family members. They are like insurance companies and retirement funds and hedge funds and other investment companies. See, here's, here's a cartoon that talks about Golden Sachs. Uh, well, the name change certainly does better for their current uh, position. And uh, it shows these guys unloading money into the, into the thing. Goldman Sachs, the, the uh, uh, Rick and the, the company approached Goldman Sachs for their financial expertise. And they began to get a sense that maybe their proprietary information was not being kept secret. Okay, here's another picture of Goldman Sachs of people going down the slide. And guess there's a hole there. And this is actually in German. <laughs> this is a German, uh, is a German characterization. <coughs> Next slide. Goldman Sachs moral compass. Every direction is toward the dollar sign. 
Next slide. Okay, financial, de de financial deregulation allowed you to create shady investments that netted you gazillions. What's your response? Thanks. So, um, so anyway, so there's there, the, the, the best uh, uh, reduced debt, and they reduced debt quite substantially. Um, uh, and along came um, uh, this company from Toronto, Brookfield, and Brookfield, uh, I'll take that back, the, the, a company, uh, a, a, a group, a consortium from Portland came along and tried to, to, to buy the company and there ended up being a board meeting in which uh, Rick and several of the directors were excluded so that other board members, the outside board members could vote and the decision was that the company should be, uh, uh, that part of the strategic plan was to put its shares up for sale. Um, uh, and uh, very much, uh, you know, people, not everybody was happy with that. Uh, so uh, Goldman Sachs helped put the company up for auction. Uh, this is in the fall of 2006. And finally, Brooks, Brookfield Asset Management uh, showed up and they offered 25% over the share price for the shares. The shares were start trading at like 23 and they offered 28, something like that. And the, uh, the thing there is because of this Sorbanes-Oxley law, which basically said if someone comes in the door with a good offer for your shares, you have to accept it. Otherwise, all these shareholders can sue you individually as the directors. So in other words, if somebody came in and knocked on your door and said, I'm here to buy your house, you gotta sell. And that's exactly, that's exactly what happened. And Brookfield came in and bought the shares for $28 a share, and the for the first time in 80 years, the uh, uh, control of the company passed out of the hands of the Wertheimer and, and Wallenberg Fanbys, which at that time owned about 15% of the uh, of the company. Uh, and many of you could probably tell the rest of that story, but Brookfield held it for, what, five years, six years, and sold it. They spun off, they sold the, the Timberlands for a ton of money, sold that to Weyerhaeuser. Sold it to Weyerhaeuser? Yeah. Yeah, immediately. Yeah, they, they sold it to Weyerhaeuser then. Yes, I'm just trying to think. They didn't sell it to Weyerhaeuser until two years ago? It's really about the same time they always sold the Capstone. Uh, that, the Capstone, that's right. So the first step was they just separated the companies and they operated the Timberlands right. independently. And then, uh, and then last year, last year, yeah, uh, the uh, Timberlands were sold to Weyerhaeuser and the mill was sold to, Cap sold to Capstone. In the meantime, the box plants, in the, in the 15 box plants, particularly in the east, uh, had been sold off, which was already part of the plan from before the sale. There was always there was, there was a big plan to get rid of the, uh, uh, the box plants and to kind of clean things up. So the end of the story was uh, Wall Street. Um, the, uh, uh, and I'm going to read to you a newspaper article that was written in June of 2007. And this appeared in the Seattle Times. And it said, since the start of 2006, one of every eight Northwest public companies has been swept up in a wave of deals fed by an ocean of cash. So fiber was just was not the only one. It was a big trend at the time. Um, want to buy stock in PW Eagle, the Eugene, Oregon pipe maker that just stopped, that just topped the Seattle Times Northwest 100 ranking of best performing companies for the second year in a row? Better hurry up because they sold. So all of these, one of eight Northwest companies, uh, 20 Northwest public companies had been acquired and taken private uh, in the year, including the, the sale by uh, sale of fiber. And, but this is, in, this is an important thing. Um, but basically it says the big loss is, is that these companies are no longer home owned and there is a tremendous loss of talent from corporate headquarters into the community because these corporate headquarters have now been moved elsewhere. Uh, precisely what happened at Fiber is that there is no more, no longer a community connection between the ownership of the mill and the community. And it'll be in the book. And I had, I had it here. It's, it's in this. I want to read it to you because it was so well done. It was. That's pretty much the end of the story. Brookstone bought it, held it, sold it, made some money, and moved on. So does anybody have any questions or any elaborations that, that would help?
Dick. Talk a little bit about your book. I realized that you did a It's the same one. It's this, we have we have a draft. We have a first draft, and we're building on the first draft. So I don't have a date yet for for a book, uh, and part of it is going to be a better curation of photographs, which is a whole separate project. But uh, I'm in the process now of of uh, working with an editor, um, uh, Jim Lamont, who used to edit the uh, 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 Quarterly. Uh, he's the editor on the whole thing, and we're passing chapters back and forth and, and punching up the language and getting more detail. And I was doing some interview. I did an interview this morning. I'll do one tomorrow morning, um, just to get some more uh, personal texture from the thing. I've interviewed a lot of union members. Uh, what it was like working in the mill. Things like the ladders and how you got hired and how many relatives you had working at the mill, that sort of thing. Any other questions at all? Well, I'll stick around a little while. I want to thank you very much. Sorry, I lost that page.